Hey, Run Tribe Bike community. Welcome to the 136th episode of our Fireside Chat on the Everyday Athlete Podcast Network. Before we get started with today's show, I want to remind you that you can find this show along with others on our network wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on the Run Tribe Bike YouTube channel. We have something for everyone from shows like our Fireside Chat today, where we have serious discussions to what's in your earbuds about music. And then we also have Food Fight Friday at the Aid Station, where we have fun discussing food. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review so that we can keep these amazing guests coming on and providing you with inspiration and motivation from everyday athletes like yourself, as well as tips from experts in the fields of nutrition, sports psychology, and coaching. Today, we are joined by Josh Fernandez. They are a runner, advocate, and leader of Philadelphia's Queer Run, which is creating a safe and athletic space for LGBTQ, IA+, and its allies. Josh was featured in our September-October magazine that you can get if you subscribe to our newsletter, as it is included in our welcome email. So without any further ado, let's bring Josh to the conversation and have a good chat. Hey, Josh, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing, Jason? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Of course. Thank you for having me. By the way, the article in our uh, September 15th uh, issue was fantastic. So again, I'm going to thank you for sitting down and chatting with Ohm and sharing that article. And then um, he shared with me your sort of testimonial, shall we say, about the conversation you had with Ohm and the Run Tri Bike family. And um, I can't tell you how much that meant to me to see those kind words. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. No, of course. Thank you for making Run Try Bike a safe space for LGBTQIA plus athletes and, you know, at, just athletes from from communities that aren't always represented in in the endurance space. It's it's fantastic. So thank you. Yeah, that was our vision and mission when I launched the business was to prove that there is a starting starting line at uh, prove that there is a spot at the starting line for everybody and every body. Um, and so far, um, hopefully we've we are attaining that vision and mission. I shared with this uh, the story with you in the green room, and I want to share it for our audience. So a couple of years ago, we put up the pride flag with our logo on it on our website and all of our other social media platforms. And then um, July first rolls around, and like the vast majority of corporate America, pride flags start to come down. Um, and as I was doing that to put up our, our normal colored logos, I realized they don't stop being queer on July 1st. Like, why would we take this down? Um, and we've kept up the flag, the pride flag with our logo on all of our social media platforms, as well as on our website. And I wanted to ask you, like, as a member of the queer community, what's it mean when you see a company you know, proudly showing the pride flag as part of their logo and part of their ethos. I think it's it's a really important signifier, and it helps make it very clear that that company is a safe space and and is interested in in doing right by the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, I think even more so than just the rainbow, and and there's a reason that Queer Runs logo is not rainbow colored. Um, I, I think. Um, that is step one is is having the kind of symbols in place making sure that you're a safe space but that is also the action and i think it 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 goes to show you know run try bikes commitment to telling queer and trans stories i think is that that extra level that and that authenticity of why having that that more more progress more pride um modern pride flag in your logo is very genuine so i again i thank you for that um i think you make an excellent point but yes i mean unfortunately there are a lot of people who will use the rainbow flag and even if they keep it up year round um and it doesn't go away once you know july 1st rolls around sometimes uh they're not always demonstrating a commitment to being inclusive for queer folks so i think as you know as long as a company is is doing things like run try bike is telling the stories and, and committed to telling stories as long as there's that extra action it means a lot that's awesome so fill me in on why queer run doesn't use uh the the pride flag or the rainbow flag in their logos yeah so i think you know i think there's a time and place for sort of you know rainbows as a symbol but when um the group that that redesigned our logo uh kind of approached it and you know uh, you can't see it right now i'm it's white on black on my tank top right now um but if you go to our website if you go to our instagram it's you know purple and orange and we're, we're really trying to um, just sort of focus on the words queer run. Like those are very powerful words. Yeah. Um, and, and putting them in rainbow, nothing wrong with people who use or, or groups that use rainbow logos. But I think the rainbow is a symbol 
Um, I think just because of what you pointed out that happens every June 1st, you know, every company, you know, wants to go rainbow for just the month of June. Right. Um, it, at some point, it does feel like it kind of cheapens that symbol. And so we want to focus on, you know, the words queer run. They're very powerful words. They're very political words. And for those of you who are going to be listening to this show mm -hmm. um, versus seeing Josh's tank top, it looks, correct me if I'm wrong, that that's like an 80s disco type of logo. Is that correct? <laughs> Well, so the the idea behind it is the lines that you see are supposed to represent track lines and oh okay um, the the designers who helped you know conceive this this logo the idea was that you know we're running as a group and so just kind of like running on a track together so that's what the track lines kind of symbolize um, but it does kind of give that kind of eighties retro vibe which I don't hate because I love eighties things so. Hey. I was born in 73. I am a product of the 80s. So that's probably <laughs> why I see that right out of the gate versus anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how did you get into running? And, and we'll talk about Queer Run as a group in a little bit, but how did you specifically get into running? Yeah, that's a great question. So I started running probably about almost 15 years ago at this point. Um, and it was not something that I ever thought I was going to do long term. It was something that I was just doing, you know, as out of college looking for, you know, establishing a routine that wasn't just, you know, me going to my nine to five, then coming home on the couch and just like vegetating. And so um, I started a couch to 5k program, did not do a 5k. My first race was a half marathon uh, a couple <laughs> years, I think maybe two years after I started. And then, you know, the rest is history, you know, the long distance bug bit me. And I've been running ever since. Um, my first marathon was the Atlantic City Marathon in 2016. Um, I've run uh, 15 marathons. I'll be doing my 16th in Honolulu in December. Um, yeah, it's it's been a really awesome journey. Uh, it's it's given a lot. It's taken a lot, but I don't regret any of it. It's been fantastic being a runner and also just being a runner in Philly. So, how did couch to 5K training end up with not a 5K first race? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I never thought it was weird. I never adopted the title as a runner. And I think, you know, um, what you were saying is like, you know, there's this, uh, uh, in the green room, there's a place for everyone at us at the starting line. I didn't really see the title runner as something that belonged to me. I felt like you had to do a race to do that. And I was always intimidated about doing it. But over time, as I was doing the couch to 5k program, like my, my Saturday runs would, you know, go as long as eight miles very regularly and they felt easy. And so it felt like at that point when I was ready to finally do a race, it didn't really feel like a 5k was going to be the kind of fun or challenge that I was looking for. Uh, and I just thought, I thought half marathon, it sounded cooler. So that's what <laughs> happened. <laughs> Has your mindset changed about the idea of the 5k not being like a, a, a long enough race? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think, yeah, absolutely. And so, um, and that's not to knock anyone who just wants to do 5k, but I think there's this thing that happens in, um, a lot of athletic spaces is I think a lot of people don't feel like they can call themselves, um, an athlete or whatever specific kind of athlete, like a runner, um, a cyclist, you know, a triathlete. I, I think a lot of people feel like they have to earn that. Um, but there's some people and there are people in queer run who they run for fun and for community. They may never do a race. Um, and those folks should absolutely call themselves runners. And so my thinking on that has evolved um, as I've become an experienced runner um, with also lots of therapy. And just in general, I think it's just important to encourage people. If you train, even if you're just a weekend warrior, if you are committed to putting on a pair of shoes or you know, if you're an adaptive athlete and you're out there training, you get to call yourself an athlete. You get to call yourself a runner. You don't need a medal to prove that. 100%. I asked that question because I refuse to race 5Ks because they hurt. So put oh. me put me at the starting yeah. line of a 100 miler or a 250 miler and I'm happy. Put me at the start line of a 5K yeah. and I am dreading it. I get hyper competitive. Uh, so yes, uh, the shorter the distance, the more pressure I feel on myself. So for me personally, I, I, I like to stick to 10 milers, half marathons, marathons, but a 5k once in a while is a little fun to see what I can do. <laughs> Good for you. I will, I will stand on the <laughs> sideline and cheer you on while you're racing that 5k. <laughs> I, I will do the same for you with hundred milers. <laughs> there we go. Very see? <laughs> There's a space for everybody in this sport. Yeah. 
So you described in your story um, that we published in our September, October mm -hmm. newsletter, or excuse me, uh, magazine that the pandemic was a difficult time for you. So I um, mm -hmm. want to talk to you about the challenges you faced um, during that time and how mm -hmm. you overcame them. Yeah, so that was a really tough year for me for for many reasons. And, and I want to, you know, have listeners kind of have a little content warning. Um, you know, I will talk about uh, sexual assault. Um, but it, laundry list of things, you know, right before the pandemic is when I sort of started coming out as non-binary and sort of navigated what that meant, not just for myself in my everyday life, but also in a world where for races, specifically as a runner, the, the gender categories that you checked were, you know, man or woman, non-binary hadn't yet emerged the way it did a few years later. Um, I was also diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that caused a lot of pain in my joints. Uh, and it took a while to get treatment. And then once I got treatment, that treatment puts me at risk of being very immunocompromised. And so having that circumstance during a global pandemic, not exactly a recipe for, you know, happiness and joy. And then sort of like the cherry on top of that Sunday was towards the end of the year, um, I was sexually assaulted. And I, I talk about this a lot more recently beyond just close family and friends, because I, I think that, you know, even in 2024, it's a topic that is not always talked about, especially from folks who aren't women and you know, women have a hard enough time. And so for you know myself as a non-binary person, as someone who sometimes looks male presenting, um, it can be challenging to navigate that story and telling that story and, and being able to normalize that experience and, and sharing it with others who need to hear it. I mean, I think a lot of people feel like they go through these things alone, mm -hmm. um, but they're not. Yeah. I just, um, I posted on my personal account about, about a depression that I had gone mm -hmm. through and it wasn't easy to talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. but the moment I pressed publish, like there was a weight lifted off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Do you find that doing the hard thing in running translates to doing the hard thing outside of running, being able to talk about these um, topics that aren't always so easy to talk about? I think that was a big starting point. I will say that like, I feel what running, the biggest gift that running has given me is resiliency. Um, training for a marathon is not always fun. It's, it's <laughs> no. oftentimes really grueling and difficult. Um, and the ability to show up for yourself for every training run, even when you don't want to do it, um, I think that builds this mental toughness in you. I think a lot of people talk about the physical benefits of running, um, and some people do talk about the mental benefits, but that's one of the mental benefits. You just, you build this confidence and this trust and this toughness in yourself that you may not realize that you had. I didn't realize I had it. Um, and so I think that that was a really perfect foundation for helping me get through the nightmare that was 2020. Um, I think what sucked about it is when it was all happening, I wasn't running or running as much as I would used to because of pain. Right. So um, I think at that time, running just felt so out of reach. Um, and this, this thing that was always there for me when I was having a hard time, it, it was so, so far gone. I never thought that, you know, there will not that I never thought, but there was a point where I was wondering, like, am I still a runner? Am I going to still be a runner when this is all done? Um, but then fast forward to, you know, treatment that helped make me be able to do things like exercise again. Um, therapy, a really awesome support network that I was very blessed to have in, in family and friends. Um, all of this was the the perfect kind of um, recipe to, to get me you know, back into the swing of things when I was ready to run again, and then to to have tools to to cope and manage with these things. But I think running was the starting point. Running was the foundation to build the kind of um, sort of toughness and and confidence and the ability to also just feel comfortable reaching out to people when I needed them. I mean, I think that is the one thing that's really beautiful about running community. Um, you know, I don't know what the endurance athletic community is like where you're at. Um, here in Philadelphia, the Philly running community is <laughs> is so wonderful. Um, and it was like the first time I, you know, talked about this experience with 2020 was at a storytelling event that was hosted by Like the Wind magazine and Diodora and Philadelphia Runner. 
Um, and there was this like anxiety about telling it. But when I looked up and saw like a bunch of friendly faces, like all these people I knew, uh, it just made it very easy. Like when you have people like that in your life who are very supportive and and very genuine and and want to hear your story, you you say it comfortably, you say it loud, and you say it proud. Were you able to meet Simon Freeman at the Like the Wind uh, presentation? Yeah. He, I, I've never met Simon in person, but we are connected on LinkedIn, and he writes some very poignant um, posts on LinkedIn just about life and the written word and what um, Like the Wind is all about. And so I can only imagine that meeting him in person would be just as phenomenal as reading his LinkedIn posts for sure. I 100% agree with that. He was a delightful person to talk to. One of the things you mentioned was that running wasn't there for you when you needed it during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing that movement in general was helpful for you, did you ever think about any other types of movement that weren't running was, you know, maybe swimming, cycling, yoga, anything? Yeah. So when I was finally able to exercise again, but maybe not quite at my, my running fitness level, or at least the, the original running fitness level that I had, I was dabbling in CrossFit and weightlifting, um, before that, though, you know, I tried yoga. Um, swimming was never really something for me. It's funny. It was like when even, you know, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first started running, it was kind of like, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears. It was like I I, I tried like the Globo Gym. Porridge. <laughs> it was definitely not for me. I tried swimming. Not very into it. Like I, I can do enough swimming just to not drown. Right. Um, biking. I'm. Uh, Eugene from Hey Arnold and very klutzy. So I should not ever be on a bike. But uh, running was just like natural for me. And I never thought I would ever say that about running. Like 16 year old Josh is so, like, wow, what? Like, <laughs> would not believe that I became a runner. Um, but yeah, so I tried other things. And I, I mean, I love strength training. I still strength train. But once I was able to go, you know, full throttle with the running again, like that is what it still occupies my time to this day. Yeah. 16 year old Jason played high school football and looked at the kids running around the track and thought, why would you be doing that? What's the, why? Like running was a punishment. Right. And now here I am like, oh, let's press register on this hundred mile race. (laughs) (laughs) That, that was me when I was signing up for my first races. It's like, wow, like 16 year old Josh, like would, would be floored. <laughs> yeah. Without a doubt. Not only mm-hmm. are you going to go run, but you're going to pay to run on top of it too. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you mentioned was community. Mm-hmm. And we mentioned, we talked about queer run mm-hmm. a little bit earlier, but I want to ask you about how you got involved in queer run. And mm-hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about what it means to be um, one of the leaders of an organization like Queer Run and, and the LGBTQIA plus community? Yeah. So um, I will just say like top level down before we talk about sort of my background with Queer Run. Queer Run was also very instrumental in my healing with everything that happened in 2020. Uh, I think through Queer Run, you know, being a leader of Queer Run, I've rediscovered my voice um, not even just rediscover my voice. I would even say maybe discover my voice. Uh, if you talk to people who knew me five years ago, 10 years ago, I think they would all agree that the way I talk now, like the way I carry myself now is very different than what it was maybe two years ago. And so, and that brings me to, you know, Queer Run came into my life in April of 2022. Uh, I was one of the first people to show up to a Queer Run Monday night run. Back then, I think it was maybe 10 or 11 people in that first Monday night photo. Um, And that was all that was there at the time. Um, Monday nights, I think it was 8 p.m. back then. We've moved it up to 7 p.m. since. Meeting in uh, Rittenhouse Square Park in Philadelphia and then doing this three-mile, three-plus-mile run, um, which is still the the kind of found, like, the, the... foundational every Monday night route usually unless something like Kamala Harris coming to Philadelphia derails it like it did last night. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But over time, Queer Run started growing. And then as Queer Run started growing, I wanted to contribute as a leader. And one of the areas that I really wanted to help represent uh, and be like a representative for Queer Run was specifically in the the advocacy efforts to get road races in Philadelphia to recognize non-binary 
elite runners in award divisions. Um, and CC Telez of Les Run, who I, I think might be featured in Run Try Bike in the very near future. Um, and if not, I beg you to please talk to CC because she has a fantastic story. Breaking um, news by Josh, CC Telez mm -hmm. will be featured on the Run Try Bike website here very soon. <laughs> Uh, Cece's delightful. And I think, um, you know, seeing what she has done, because she helped Philadelphia Runner and Students Run Philly start the first major elite non-binary division at the Philadelphia Distance Run in 2021. Um, that all came together very beautifully, and it kind of set the expectation level that myself and a lot of other non-binary runners have for what non-binary inclusion looks like at uh, a road race. And so uh, I wanted to represent Queer Run in those meetings. I was already joining CC as an athlete and talking as an athlete, but I wanted to talk as a representative of this really awesome growing LGBTQ plus run club, Queer Run. So uh, over time, the founder of Queer Run stepped away and then myself and two other leaders were kind of filling in those shoes. Um, and then we rebuilt the, the leadership team and helped spearhead the new logo redesign, a lot of different new initiatives. Um, we kept sort of a lot of the, the things that were working really well. And then the things, um, you know, that we're constantly talking about now, even to this day, you know, we're soliciting member feedback. We're, you know, kind of looking at what other run clubs do that we want to try and emulate, but also still trying to like carve our own sort of individual ideas and spin on things. And so it's just been a really fantastic opportunity, you know, for myself. I think I, I feel really privileged to lead Queer Run. I feel really blessed to co-lead with some pretty awesome people who are, are very creative, who are very dedicated to like cultivating this very um, warm, very uh, accepting group of people who all want to run together at 7 p.m. on a Monday night or at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night or uh, get up at 6 a.m. and meet at Love Park to do a four mile run and then, you know, drink and chug strawberry oat milk lattes at Elixir in Center City. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good time. And uh, I enjoy every minute of it. And, you know, there are some times where I'm like, wow, I wish I could clone myself and have more time to do uh, more for a queer run. But I think that's what's great about having the co-leaders that I have is that we all piggyback off of one another and we all support one another. Do you ever take a moment to step back and, and reflect on what you have seen progress? Because the, the what you said was the very first picture you remember of Queer Run had about eight members in it. Um, when you think about it today and you think about that progression line, does it give you perspective on and say to yourself, holy shit, we've, we're doing this. Like, this is cool. We're doing this. Yeah. So I, I don't think I do it as often as I probably should. But I think there are a lot of times, like when I was talking with Ohm and when I was uh, writing the story I was going to tell for uh, that, like the wind event, uh, I was going through some old photos and I saw like, yeah, it was like eight to 11 people, the first few photos. And then when you scroll over the grid and scroll up over time, it grows. You know, I think at one time we almost reached, if we didn't reach 70 members one point this summer. Um, and then even our Thursday morning runs, there was a time when there was maybe three or four of us consistently, and especially during like that first winter in like 2022, 2023. But over time, even, you know, as, as recently as maybe August, I think we maybe had like 20 plus runners on a Thursday morning run, like people who are like getting up 5.30 to like commute to the meeting spot to do a 6 a.m. four mile run. It's pretty <laughs> great. Yeah, that's amazing. And and so my job now is to send you an email like once every three weeks to remind you to celebrate something because we often get caught in the minutia of it all. <clears throat> Excuse me, get caught in the minutia of it all. And we don't see the the progress that we're making all along the way. Um, so be prepared to get inundated with emails from me to help you celebrate the progress that you're making with Queer Run there in Philadelphia. Um one of the things that you said earlier was warm and fuzzy group and community. And we all know that life isn't always unicorns and rainbows and that there are mm -hmm. obstacles that get presented to us uh, on a regular basis for some of us. Um, recently, you've been, um, I don't know if the words fighting in air quotes is correct, 
Um, but you've been dealing um, with the Philadelphia Marathon to develop equity for non-binary non-binary athletes. Excuse me. Um, talk about that a little bit, and talk about why it matters. Yeah. So, um, again, and this was pr probably like the biggest kind of um, motivator for me to say to you know the then uh, the, the founder of Queer Run, hey, I want to join leadership. Was um, seeing that the Philadelphia Marathon in 2022 opened registration opportunities for non-binary runners. So they made a, a non-binary category. So it was no longer just two boxes. If you were non-binary, you could go check it. Um, folks who crossed that finish line who were non-binary, especially non-binary youth, crossed that finish line and were misgendered. And, and not only were they misgendered, but they also weren't given prize money in a city that just had a did a major first had like um the 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 Philadelphia distance run in 2021 and 2022 award the top five non-binary finishers so um in cc and i we met with the philadelphia marathon director and, and some other key players um at the at the marathon level and also at the city level since the city manages the the marathon when and we met with second, them Josh. over two years go for so, it so so how do you get that meeting to take place yeah, so we wrote the the director, CC and I, uh, about some of the things that we were very disappointed in, primarily that um, the misgendering happened for a lot of the athletes who crossed the finish line in 2022. And we also wanted to sort of ask them about, you know, hey, you didn't market this. You know, we would have promoted this if we had known it existed. Many people didn't know until maybe a few weeks before that that was an option um, if you hadn't already checked. So, um, and at the time, the director was very open and wanting us to have conversations with her and really start uh, working towards um, improving equity overall. Uh, we made it very clear to her, CC and I, that from the very beginning, part of that equity was having an awards category that helped cultivate an elite non-binary field. Um, so fast forward to, so that was 2022, fast forward to uh, fall 2023, uh we find out from the race director and a consultant that she hired uh that non-binary runners could compete for prize money dot 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 if they misgendered themselves to take from the male or female elite prize pot clearly i'm stumbling over my own tongue here but why 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 do that like did they did did the race director explain why they were doing that as opposed to just creating a separate category? There were a few things. I mean, the the overarching like TLDR is that uh, the, the city and the marathon race director insist that this is um, a very complex issue, that there are a lot of things like USATF guidelines that prohibit this, but CC and I have debunked that several times. <laughs> um, the, the the city it manages the prize money not usatf and there are other marathons in the country that have what is called an elite field for non-binary runners who meet certain qualifying times missoula marathon jersey city marathon um uh, uh vermont marathon um there there are many other races that are doing this and the broad street run which is a major 10 mile race here in philadelphia Philadelphia distance run that I keep referencing and Philadelphia 10K and, and a handful of other road races in the city recognize and award non-binary runners. The Philadelphia Marathon is the only one that doesn't. Um, and so we've been pushing through protests, through email campaigns for more work. We worked with someone in the mayor's office who's kind of a new player with the... Um, with sort of the, I'm sorry, not the mayor's office, the managing director's office, um, who's just kind of new to sort of, you know, working with CC and me and we're trying to help find a solution. The solution that they came to is that um, they're still not gonna have an elite non-binary division. They're gonna award the top non-binary runners through what is called an open division, which is still significantly less prize money. Um, and still is not a fully equitable solution for non-binary runners and is not doing what we would love to do, which is cultivate a space for non-binary athletes to develop 
the possibility of a professional career as a runner. Um, you know, we think that all these races need to make these changes for all these bigger governing bodies to catch on and realize that it's 2024. Non-binary identities aren't new and non-binary people don't are we're we're behind in sort of being able to cultivate professional athletic careers in elite spaces and that's not going to happen if you don't cultivate the field if you don't build it yeah like i mean for those of you who are going to be listening to this show on our podcast like i have a, a very perplexed look on my face um for the simple fact that josh just listed off four marathons so this is not groundbreaking by any stretch of the imagination at this point right where if you were the first to, to break ground, I could see dragging your feet, trying to figure out the ifs, ands, whys, and buts. But at this point, you're not. Um, and, and so I have, I, I just, there's so many things running through my head as to why not. Like, is that a question that you ask your, you ask the race director and, and the managing director? Like, why not? It's as simple as that. Like, why not do this? We've asked them many times and we get this sort of roundabout response that is essentially like it's, the open division awards is the best we can do now and that they're open to more conversations. And the thing is, you know, CC and I have done two years of conversations. Right. Our community has done countless uh, forms of activism and advocacy around this issue and around specifically the marathon's lack of action. And the other thing too, that I think is really important to say, because I keep talking about not just running community, but the running community in Philly. I think that if you are a part of a running community in any city you're, and you are very networked into it, you probably really love it. And I'm sure everyone will probably say the same thing about their city that I'm going to say about Philadelphia. But the Philadelphia running community is very magical. It is this very warm family. No, no run clubs are competitive. There are people in queer run who run with three to four other run clubs. Um, we have the running community behind us, behind Queer Run and Les Run and, and Cece and me saying, this is ridiculous. Make this change. Did you so coordinate? You, oh, we've, yeah, we, we've coordinated protests. We've coordinated um, email campaigns. You know, I will say that like when we first started doing um, like our Instagram campaign, when we did our protests earlier this summer, uh, I got very teary eyed seeing the people who showed up. Like I, I was very, very... Um, blessed to see so many people sh either share things online like we we enabled it so that the queer run email account was copied when people were sending emails to make it like a very easy like you know fill out your name and send to the, the race director um everyone who showed up to the protest and made signs or came to hold signs and even went up to have conversations with the race director directly i mean that like I took note of that and it was like emotionally overwhelming in a good way because it, it's very clear to me that like this is something the Philadelphia running community wants and it's it's what we uphold for the people who are running events like this that that our communities participate in. I mean, CC says this all the time. Philadelphia is a great city of firsts and the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Marathon is missing out on an opportunity to be a big marathon player cultivating an elite non-binary field that other people can emulate. Yeah. Like I just keep thinking about the downside. So pardon me for a minute while I put my adjunct teacher hat on, I, I teach marketing and the elasticity of demand, right? If we change one thing, what happens to the demand? And so presume that they open up an elite non-binary category. Mm -hmm. They're probably not losing any runners, right? Like I can't imagine runners are going to be like, well, now that you have this, I'm out. And what you actually can are going to do is bring more people in to the space to run, mm -hmm. right? And show off the city of Philadelphia and all the great things that Philly has to offer um, to, to tourists who are coming there for the first time, while also letting the um, athletes who live in Philadelphia know that they're welcome in this race as well. So I, the why not is still bothering me. And I know I'm not going to solve it in our conversation today, um, but I would love to keep talking with you about this even offline as we um, continue down the path of trying to blaze trails, um, for lack of a better phrase, because we want to, um, as we talked with um, Kelsey Long from the long run, or we run long, excuse me, we don't want to just be allies. We want to be accomplices and we want to help 
get this movement going in the right direction. And so lean on us, Josh, as much as um, you need to. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about earlier today, um, Rach McBride, who is a non-binary elite athlete, they race in the uh, elite levels of triathlon. They race at the elite levels of mountain biking. Um, they posted a picture today and we've had Rach on our shows n numerous times. And I, I wonder when you see a non-binary athlete posting pictures, being unapologetically themselves, what's the emotion you feel? How does that move you when you see that um, happening on social media? It's very inspiring. I mean, I've seen those photos of Rachel and I think that it's, it's important for not just people like me. I mean, I'm in my like mid to late thirties. So sure. I love the inspiration, but the people who need to see that inspiration are queer and trans and non-binary youth. They need to see athletes like Rachel, like Nikki Hiltz, like Cal Calmia. They need to see those folks living their uh, authentic lives living their unapologetic truth as athletes and in spaces that are cultivating that. And so, you know, the, the Olympics this summer, every time Nikki Hiltz was performing, I was making sure I was on mute and my, and like off camera, my team's meetings or, you know, up at like a, a ridiculously early hour to catch their races. I mean, I think that's the thing. I mean, I think that's, that's the whole thing about the Philadelphia marathon stuff too. It's like, what, we're hoping to do, especially, and you know, not to to bring up politics, but especially everything given today, yes. there's a, there's a lot at stake, and there are a lot of communities that are going to be affected, and the the LGBTQIA plus community, but specifically trans and non-binary folks and trans and non-binary youth, they're going to feel the brunt of what could happen, and mm -hmm. um, it's not just yeah. you know regarding you know, the the ability to get prize money. I mean, I'm I'm up at night thinking, well, what's going to happen if you know folks start roll backing, rolling back registration, or um, you know, there's already so many laws, uh, you know, going forth in many different states to try and you know either you know ban or limit trans and non-binary participation in sports um, at like the at like a, a teen middle school kind of level, and so. Uh, I think, you know, with all this happening, it's so important for folks like Rachel, uh, like Cal, like Nikki, to be living out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we want to be accomplices. Um, I'd love to get more businesses to be accomplices in this movement. Um, we don't know what we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. I don't live in your skin. I don't live the life that you live. Um, so help educate me and, and our listeners who are not on what can we do to make our spaces more inviting and more welcoming and, and let those that are in the LGBTQIA plus community know that you can, let's go hang out, let's chat, let's go share a coffee, let's go break bread. Like, what is it that we can do to, to ensure that we are in lockstep with what you're trying to do with Queer Run um, and be, like I said, accomplices and not just allies? No, oh, I appreciate that. And the other thing too, it's like something I keep hearing, you know, in the last few years, and it's just very true is like, um, I think it's the saying is like, allyship is, you know, a verb, not a noun. So it's like taking action is so important. And I think the the first step is just making sure you're educating yourself about what's going on in your local community. You know, look for, you know, queer, trans, or at least any kind of LGBTQIA specific athletic organization, see what they're doing, talk to them, network with them, see what initiatives they're working on. Um, if anyone is working on something like with what Les Run and Queer Run is doing with the Philadelphia Marathon, get involved. Um, help, you know, raise awareness, help, you know, be loud and, and join protests and, you know, any kind of campaign that they need, you know, help be the person who is you know, a, a lot of times, you know, it, it's funny until you, until we had our protest, you would think that I think the perception is that it's just CCME just being very noisy Philadelphian citizens. And I think the protest was important to show, no, it's not just us and it's not just our run clubs. There are people, you know, in the entire running community that support us and, and offering that same kind of support in your local community is so important. Um, and then it's just even whether it's minor inclusive changes in your clubs, 
um, normalize introducing yourself and including your pronouns so that if someone uses they them pronouns or uh, some combination of pronouns or neo pronouns that they feel comfortable um, disclosing that so they can be their authentic self in your spaces. If you are part of a race that doesn't have a non binary registration option, you know, or even an awards category, you know, get in contact with the organizers, find out why that is and, and encourage them to do better and do right. Uh, I think these are all the things that you can do um, if whether, you know, you're cisgender, whether you're cis and heterosexual and you want to show your support, um, you know, there's so many ways to do it. It's just a matter of, you know, picking where to start, whether it's seeing what your local queer athletic uh, clubs are doing or seeing what the the events in your area are offering or not offering and what they can do to improve. Yeah, and, I, and I'll put I'll lay this out there too. We when we spoke to uh, we run long, Becky Croft um, was there, and and I had talked to her prior to the show, and she's a native woman, and I asked her the same question, and she said, "Go look at your social feed. Who are you following? Who are you seeing more of? And if you're not seeing enough native women um, athletes in your feed, go follow a few." And then go follow a few um, black runners and then go follow a few queer runners. And it'll change your perspective because you'll start to read and see different faces and voices and images. Um, and it was a simple thing, right? It literally, you have your phone in your hand probably 16, 18 hours a day. Just go there and tap a few buttons. And next thing you know, you'll start to see different um, faces and perspectives. And, and I would encourage people to do that. Go follow Josh uh, on Instagram. Follow Queer Run as well on Instagram, follow CC, follow Les Run, and just get that in your feed and start to um, hear what they have to say and feel what they have to say. Um, we do have a comment from Instagram, Chris, uh, Chris Reimer13. This conversation is amazing. Thank you for sharing these experiences, Josh. I, I second that. Um, they also mentioned that um, we probably would have had a bigger audience on another night, and we don't disagree with you. Um, we understand that this is election night. It's a big deal. Um, this show will also come out in podcast form later on. So people will be able to listen to it after election night anyway. Um, and we thought it was important to have a conversation like this on a day like today, which is super important to, um, the United States. Um, Josh, I want to be respectful of your time. I do have a handful of random food questions to throw at you, but before we get to that, where can people find you? Where can they be a part of the movement to get the Philadelphia marathon to recognize the, the elite non-binary division? Where can we show up to help? Well, thank you so much for asking all of that. So I would say definitely start by following Queer Run on Instagram, Queer Run, one word. Follow Les Run on Instagram, Les Run, one word. Um, that's the best way to stay in touch with the work that CC and I and, and our our peer leaders are working on with the Philadelphia Marathon. Um, go to www.queerrun.com. Our website also has a page that talks a lot about the Philadelphia Marathon. And still, I think that the email campaign is up. I, I, I would not mind people who want to join in on that and remind the Philadelphia Marathon organizers that we haven't gone away and that uh, we're still pushing for, for equity. I mean, We'll be taking action in other ways that we'll be talking about in the coming months. But for now, I think those are the best ways is, you know, follow us. When you see us post about action we're taking, show us the support that you can. That's it, folks. It's real simple. A, a couple of button taps and you're there and then share it to your story so that everybody else can see it too. Um, it literally is like dominoes. You push one down and the, and the other start to fall down. Um, so are you ready for the, for the food questions, Josh? Let's go. By the way, I'm not going to uh, lie about this. I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, you know, I'm a bald guy. So I'm looking at your hair and I'm like, damn. A <laughs> uh, lot of the good rinse creams and dry shampoo. <clears throat> yeah, for me, it's just uh, soap and water these days. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Food questions. Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Yay. Oh, come on. You're an oh. East Coaster. How are we putting pineapple on pizza? I know, but I had it like a few times and I've really enjoyed it every single time. All right. So here's here's the question that delineates whether you actually like pineapple on pizza in my mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. Does it have to have like jalapenos or Canadian? Well, you don't eat meat, you said. So does it have to mm -hmm. have um, jalapenos or something else with it? Or you're, you're straight, give me a cheese pizza and throw some pineapple on there. 
I know I will tell you there was one time I did have it with jalapenos and I think that was the level up that was like, oh yeah, I, I can get on board with this. <laughs> That's what, so Ohm, whenever he talks about pineapple on pizza, he always says, yeah, I love it with, with jalapeno. I'm like, so you don't actually like pineapple on pizza. You like it with all these other things. Then. Flavors. That's my delineation. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I could stay yeah. business partners with him. <laughs> <laughs> Oreos. Are you a fan of Oreos? A big fan of Oreos. OG Oreo or double stuff Oreo? I won't talk about the other two abominations, the Thins and the Cakester. Yeah, don't talk about the Thins. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, those should be outlawed. I'm a big fan of double stuff. And the and the way the way Josh Fernandez eats his Oreos is. So I love to take them apart or dip them in peanut butter. Dip them in peanut butter. Yeah. Oh, new entrant to the list. I'm going to have to add that to um, mm -hmm. Jason Fitzgerald answered the question. The way he eats is, is he throws the first one in the glass of milk and he lets it basically dissolve while he's eating the other 10 or 12. And so then when he's done, he drinks it and he's like, it's like a getting a cookies and cream ice cream uh, shake okay. kind of concept. See, at first I'm like, uh, then the cookie's all soupy, but then I guess it gives <laughs> that milkshake feel. Yeah. By the way, I eat Oreos like aspirin. I just throw the whole thing in there. I don't do anything with it. <laughs> That's what I do with olives. Yes. Mm. I love all. I just had a whole conversation last night with Lori about olive tapenade and how I am craving some crusty baguette with olive tapenade. Get a little bit of chopped garlic in there and we're, we're, mm. we're on the highway to heaven right there. Licorice, red or black or neither. 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 Are peeps a real candy or are they just dust balls covered in glitter? Dust balls covered in glitter. <laughs> yes. Is candy corn a real candy or is it just earwax covered in sugar? Ugh, barf. <laughs> <laughs> are the candy circus peanuts real candy or are they just the Amazon stuffing uh, painted orange? Amazon stuffing painted orange. <laughs> Okay, grandma's uh, candy dish. You have butterscotch, you have the strawberry filled candy, and you have the peppermint. Which one are you taking? Ooh, this is tough. I kind of want to, I would go for peppermint. Nice, me too, every time. Mm -hmm. Creamy or crunchy peanut butter? Creamy. How do you make your peanut butter and jelly sandwich? There is an infinitely disgusting amount of peanut butter to the jelly peanut butter ratio. Um, and then I try and cut the corners off. Like I love the like little crustables you can buy in freezers yes. at the supermarkets. So I, I try to mimic that. I tell this story all the time. Shannon Mick, who goes by we uh, Be Short Run Ultra, I asked her that mm. question and she said she cuts it into two rectangles, the bread, and then she turns the bread so that she has a handle and eats it like corn on the cob. And then she just so that she doesn't eat the crust, but her mm. hands don't get messy from the jelly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah, I love for as you can tell, I love talking about food and how people eat because it it blows my mind that we are all so different in the way we consume food, but we all love basically love the same foods in in some form or fashion. Oh, absolutely. Well, in everything you listed, all this food conversation, like this is what endurance athletes do. That's right, exactly. <laughs> I just walked through the grocery store, and on the way through, there were. Uh, the strawberry uncrustables, the grape uncrustables, the honey uncrustables, and now the chocolate hazelnut spread uncrustables. Mm. And that was like, you know, manna from heaven for an endurance athlete walking through that space. <laughs> the NFL posted that I think NFL teams eat 80,000 uncrustables in a year. And I'm like, man, that's like a 100 miler for most ultra runners. Come on. <laughs> red velvet cake. Is red velvet a real flavor or is it just chocolate cake dressed up to go to the prom? My siblings would probably fight me on this, but it's chocolate cake dressed up to go to the prom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they're going to charge you $12.99 for the same slice that the chocolate cake is $6.99 for. Like, just give me the chocolate cake. Yeah. Do you, uh, so you're in Philadelphia, you don't eat meat, but you did mention that you do have some, um, vegan cheesesteak joints. So, so what's the, the best vegan cheesesteak I can get in Philadelphia these days? Go to Triangle Tavern. It's not far from Pats and Gino's. It's uh, on Passyunk Avenue. 
fantastic food all around. Like they have really good options for omnivores, uh, but really good vegan vegetarian selection. And their vegan cheesesteak is the bomb.com. Uh, that's probably one of my favorites. Monster Vegan also has a really good chopped cheesesteak sandwich. And they also have this, uh, this vegan, like very ribeye, um, mock meat that they make another alternative cheesesteak with. That's also really good. I'm going to have to get on a board a plane and get over to um, Philadelphia very soon. Your yeah. favorite candy bar is? Oh, my favorite candy bar. Uh, that is really hard. Um, in a past life, I would have said Twix. These days, it's like Ghirardelli dark chocolate. That, I mean, it's hard mm. to beat that, honestly. Mm. Yeah. Favorite flavor of ice cream is? Oh, so I'm not a big ice cream person, but when I am, I love these like boutique ice cream places in Philly that have these really funky flavors. Um, like there's this one called Milk John that has this Earl Grey tea flavor Whoa. that is pretty, really, it's pretty great. Um, but growing up as a kid, I was the weirdo who loved strawberry ice cream. So, <laughs> I mean, sometimes, sometimes going back to a classic works. Does the does the uh, Earl Grey donut taste like a London Fog drink? Kind of. I'm, kind a, of. Huge, I'm a huge fan of London Fogs. I had one just before this uh, mm. recording, by the way. Oh, nay. Well, you, you mentioned donuts. I'm a big donut person, too. And yeah, I let's talk about that. A, I, have, I have to give a shout out to Dottie's Donuts. Fantastic vegan donuts. They do a theme for everything. Um, they, I think they like joined the many like Blink-182 fans in July when Blink-182 was in town and declared that tour date like Blink-182 day in Philly. And they made like an Aliens Exist themed donut. It was pretty great. That's fantastic. I love donuts. My favorite mm -hmm. type of donut, uh, there's a place here in LA called Sidecar. They're in El Segundo. And they make a uh, blueberry cake with lemon glazed donut. It's oh, unreal. Awesome. It's yeah. unreal. So, um, last food question for you. Mm. There's a tray of brownies on the counter. Is Josh going into the middle of the tray for the ooey gooey section, or are they going to the edge of the tray for the middle, slightly ooey gooey, but with some crust to hold on to? I want the crust. <laughs> I'm actually might only eat the crust if I'm being honest. <laughs> yes. Are you in a la mode? Yeah. Are you put? What are you going with? Just uh, straight vanilla bean? Yeah, probably. Are you a coffee fan? Uh, well, only with my oxygen. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, actually today I was tame. I had three cups of coffee today. Typically, it's anywhere from five to seven. I had three cups of coffee by 9 a.m. today, just so you know. Oh, yeah, like I was, I mean, it's the day to do it. It was the day to do it. So here's mm -hmm. my tip for you. When you next time you have brownies, in, replace the vanilla bean with coffee ice cream in the mug, and so then as the coffee ice cream melts, you end up getting like a mocha type scenario with the chocolate brownie on the bottom. It's phenomenal. Hmm. Okay, I'll have to give that a try. For more nutrition tips, come and hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who are listening, be sure to go to Instagram, check out Queer Run at Queer Run, all one word, as well as Les Run at Les Run, L E Z R U N. Um, Josh and the Queer Run community is going to be making inroads, and we want you to help them. Um, go to queerrun.com as well and check out what they're doing there because um, we all need to be in this fight together. Um, again, Josh, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate everything that you shared, including your story in our September magazine, and um, looking forward to becoming a bigger accomplice uh, in this movement. Thank you so much, Jason. I really appreciate it. You got to have a great night.